When I was a young boy living in the Philippines, I lived next door to a girl named Amelia. Amelia was about the same age as me. She had a slight build, long, perfectly cut straight black hair that went down to the middle of her back, and skin paler than most Filipino children I knew. I remember asking my mum about her because she looked so different to all the kids I was used to playing with. My mum explained that her fairness was due to her being probably a mestiza of mixed blood and never being allowed to play outside. This explanation made every sense to me, as I realised I only saw her through the curtain of a house's left front window, and never outside, playing with the other kids. The other odd thing about her was that no matter what clothes she was wearing, she always had tied around her neck in a perfect bow, a beautifully kept yellow ribbon, as if her complexion and isolation from other children wasn't enough to make her stand out. No one I knew wore anything like that, especially in the Philippine heat. As my childhood rolled on, I continued to catch glimpses of Amelia staring out at the street, while me and the other neighbourhood kids played. I would try to wave on occasion, but that only seemed to scare her off, and I wouldn't see her again that week. The other children labelled her a multo, and said that I would become haunted if I tried to interact with her. I brushed off their comments as my curiosity and sympathy would not let me ignore her existence. On my sixth birthday, I asked my mum if I could bring a piece of cake over to Amelia's house to invite her to come over and play. My mum said that she didn't know her parents and was hesitant to send me over to a stranger's house. I begged and argued that Amelia wasn't a stranger, just a friend who I hadn't been able to speak with yet. Eventually my mum conceded and I was able to make my way to the house next door with a piece of birthday cake. The house itself was an old three-story mansion of Spanish architecture. Each story had two large windows facing the street, and each window was covered with thick grey curtains that did not allow a glimpse to the inside. The garden was barren, and large iron gates prevented any entrance to the sides or the back of the house. The only sign that the house was occupied was the pale-skinned girl with the yellow neck ribbon now standing in front of the curtains of the house's left front window. I waved to announce my presence to her, and before she could disappear, I raised the plate holding the piece of cake high into the air, and pointed at it excitedly. She stopped, stared for a moment, then sheepishly pointed to the large iron gate to the left of the window. I approached, and realised that the gate had a small hole in it from some of the bars being rusted off. I slowly climbed through, careful not to drop my peace offering, and stood up to see a small hand waving from a partially open window on the side of the house. I walked towards the window and came face to face with the mysterious girl that had been my neighbour all these years. She introduced herself, took the plate from my hands, smiled and disappeared into the house. After that first meeting with Amelia, we became close friends. Every week I brought her a treat, a piece of candy, a cake, an ice block during the hotter days, and every week she would direct me to the small hole in the gate and receive my gift through a small, partially open window on the side of the house. At first she would only say hi and thank you, but as the weeks went on, she began to tell me more about herself and her life. She was an only child to an ill mother and a foreign father. She didn't linger too long on this topic, looking visibly uncomfortable when mentioning her father. She was homeschooled by her mother, who was mostly bedridden and so was able to stay with her all day. When I asked why she wasn't allowed to go outside, she said she had to take care of her mother, which I thought was understandable. However, asking about the ribbon around her neck would end our conversations. I only asked two or three times before realising it was not a topic up for discussion. The friendship went on for the entire year. On the night of the seventh birthday, I came back to Amelia's house, excited to regale her with stories of the outside world, and to celebrate one year of our friendship with the same cake I had first given her. However, when I reached the metal gate, I was met with new iron bars and no hole in sight. I doubled back at the window where Amelia would stand and waited a few minutes before knocking gently on it. A moment passed, and then another, and just when I was about to return home, Amelia's slight frame came into view. My heart leaped with excitement, but that moment was short-lived 
as I noticed tears rolling down Amelia's pale cheeks. I opened my mouth to ask what was wrong, but she put a finger up to her lips to silence me. Silent and still crying, she reached behind her neck and slowly undid the bow of yellow ribbon. My stomach dropped as I saw the ribbon fall to the ground, revealing a noose of purple bruises, and in the middle of a dark ring, a thick crimson slip drawn across her porcelain neck. I stifled a scream and felt my insides wretch. Amelia's tears were now rolling down her neck into the wound and continuing down her chest crimson red. She opened her mouth as if to apologise for startling me, but all that came out was a gurgled whisper. We both stood there, crying in silence, and before I could react, her mother said thank you and walked through the thick grey curtains out of view. I stood there frozen for a moment before staggering back to my house in disbelief, crawling into my bed and forcing myself to believe that this was nothing but a vivid, lucid nightmare. I woke up the following morning to the sound of police cars at the front of Amelia's house. The new report stated that Amelia's mother was found dead of natural causes, but that the father had seemingly slit Amelia's throat with a box cutter before hanging himself from the third story balcony. The news story read, Years of abuse culminating in a murder-suicide. The house became a crime scene and was inaccessible for about a week. After the police cleared out, I returned to the house to pay my respects to my lost friend. As I approached the left front window, I noticed something lying next to the shattered glass on the floor. It was a perfectly kept yellow lip ribbon. I picked it up and with tears in my eyes said thank you, I'm sorry, and goodbye. My mom died in childbirth. They say it rained that night like the heavens lost an angel. She was cremated and her ashes spread on a favourite lake, as per her wishes. Finally, she melted into the water she loved so much, becoming one with it. I don't have many memories of dad either, just some faint ones of him making me blueberry pancakes, my favourite to this day. Dad increasingly turned to alcohol to nurse his broken heart, but he was a caring father. He died in an accident when I was six. My sweet aunt Lina, dad's sister, took me in. I was a quiet child. Painting was my only solace. I could paint for days continuously without bothering anybody. Soon, I noticed that whenever I painted rain, it actually rained. Aunt Lina jokingly remarked that I have my mom's luck with rain. I loved rain just as she used to. It was my connection to mom. I would stand with my little round face pressed against the window, looking at the clouds gathering till they pour. I would smile at the sky as the silver drops drenched my tiny frame. It felt like a loved one's hug. I missed you, I smiled and whispered. The undulating blob of water jumped like a happy puppy. It fell on my feet in a splash as Aunt Lena opened the back door to call me for lunch. When I asked Aunt Lena about it, she chided me for having an overactive imagination. That's when I knew the rain was different for me. School is a torment for most shy kids. It was tenfold for me. Aunt Lena encouraged me to come out of my shell and make friends after school. That failed spectacularly. I was bullied constantly. I guess kids could sense I was different and treated me with a cruelty that only kids are capable of. For the first time, I had an overwhelming realisation that I didn't belong. Myla, however, was different too. She was sensitive and shy, and we quickly became best friends. She sang beautifully, and her favourite song of all time was Somewhere Over the Rainbow. We were practically inseparable. I didn't even feel the need to paint. I was that happy. All was sunny for a few years until Myla got diagnosed with aggressive blood cancer. I prayed, I begged, I pleaded, but Myla was fading away in front of me. That final day, I sang to her till she quietly slipped away over the rainbow. She went to heaven, and I went back to my only refuge, my paints. This time when it rained, something had changed. The blob had a head and stumps like a gingerbread man made of water. Time passed, and I, as I grew up, so did he. 
We went from hopping together in puddles to walking with interlocked arms, basking in each other's company every time it rained. He was my angel. Aunt Lynn had a string of relationships, none of them lasting more than a few months. Most people found it hard to make room in their heart for a bonus kid, especially knowing I wasn't hers. Some even suggested sending me to foster care or at least a boarding school. Aunt Lena would promptly show them the door. When I would ask her to let me go, she would joke, You're the cheese to my cracker, sweetie. Without you, I'm just hard and salty. Aunt Lena's new boyfriend, Ted, was nice to begin with. He showered her with presents and attention. He even got me gifts, but I was wary of him. He was a little too nice. Then it started with random comments. Were you talking to someone else when I messaged last night? That dress is too hot to just go meet friends. You like that lipstick? It makes you look old. You'd be perfect if you lost a little weight. My once confident Aunt Lena became withdrawn and unsure. I urged her to break it off when he hit her for talking to an ex. He begged for forgiveness and she forgave him till I saw him one night, standing in the dark, just staring at her bedroom window. When she confronted him, he said he wanted to make sure she was not meeting her ex. She realised he had been stalking her. This was a red flag she couldn't ignore. She finally broke up with him. He started showing up everywhere, at work, at home, at stores, begging her to reconsider. He threatened every guy she dated, sometimes gatecrashing when they were on a date. He punched a guy who refused to back off. She got a restraining order, but he broke it with impunity, and she had no proof. She was too afraid to even sleep. Every little noise woke her up, so one day, tired of it all, she took enough pills to sleep forever. My world stopped revolving. Neighbours rallied around me for a while, bringing me food, helping me clean, even sleeping over so I didn't feel lonely. But eventually, everyone left. That night, I painted up a storm, literally. I was giving in the finishing touches when I heard a faint click behind me. Ted stood in the doorway with a cocked gun, looking crazed. You're the reason she broke up with me, he snarled. You're the reason she's dead. His face twisted with resentment. Everybody around you dies. His finger pressed the trigger, and I felt myself falling back on my bed in slow motion. The bullet had only grazed my arm, but it hurt like hell. Suddenly, I saw a silvery flash, and Ted was engulfed in a bubble of water. He gasped in surprise, and the water shoved its way in, down his throat. He started flailing and running around, trying to break the bubble. But how can you outrun yourself? He eventually fell on the bedroom floor, thrashing like a fish out of water, till everything was still, even his eyes. The bubble left Ted and took on a familiar human form. My angel approached me with gentle eyes and a fluid motion as I writhed in pain. He caressed my bloody arm, and it was healed as if touched by the spring of eternal life. In one night, I saw him kill and heal, and I realised his true potential, and mine. How many years later, as I sip my morning coffee, I see my daughter Eva paint rain for the first time. I see the clouds gather outside. Time for Eva to make a new friend. Cursed with death and blessed with rain, that's the dichotomy of my existence, and also... My legacy. It happened, I think, a month ago. Ants were infesting my room, coming from a specific wall that led to the outside. So because of this, I rearranged my room in a strange fashion. But it worked for me, and it was only supposed to be temporary. My room is large and wooden. It sits on the second story, with only two walls leading up the outside. Originally, my bed was facing outwards below a window, but as said prior, I moved it because of the ants. Its new position is in the exact middle of the room. I know, it's kind of unorthodox. I could have just moved it to the walls that don't go to the outside, but I was afraid of them coming through there, too, somehow. I became a bit paranoid, even though there wasn't a need for it, but... Whatever. So my bed now sits in the middle of the room, with my bookcase right behind it. And this bookcase is loosely filled with books, knickknacks, and other things. But you can see through it to the other side, from both sides. 
this is where the issue lies. I honestly didn't think much of it. It didn't seem like a problem to me. When I first put it there, I couldn't have expected what happened. The first night was fine. I slept well. But as the night started to go, I got less and less sleep. This affected my days and made it really hard to do simple tasks like chores and homework. And it's not like something specific was keeping me up. I just, I couldn't sleep. I was tossing and turning all night and it was miserable. After exactly nine nights, on the 10th night is when it first happened. I'd been tossing and turning like I normally did. It was probably somewhere around 4 a.m. at the time, determined by the hand on the clock that I could barely see from my bed. It was near fucking pitch black in my room. No night lights or anything, because I wouldn't have normally been afraid of the dark. I heard a shuffling sound from behind my bed. Like something was moving my books very slowly and very silently. At this point, my eyes shot open and you know that feeling of absolute terror when you think you hear something when nothing is supposed to be making any noise? That was happening. I could feel every fucking strand of hair on me stick up because no one else was in my room. We didn't have rats or mice and I definitely didn't let one of the animals in here. For the first few seconds, I didn't move. I was terrified, but I thought that maybe I was hearing things. It was 4am after all, and no sleep can sometimes make you hear or see things. At least, that's what I thought at the moment. I didn't know how sound that logic was, but I was fucking praying it was right. It didn't stop, but I didn't move. Not until there had been at least two minutes of something moving my things around. My breathing was starting to make too much noise. And when I let out a winded, shaky breath, the something stopped. I immediately shot my head up, my entire body in fight or flight. I bolted to my door, opened it and fucking booked it out of my room. I didn't hear or see anything on my way out and I didn't want to. I woke my mum up and told her about it. She reminded me of the time in our old house, how I would hear a clicking sound sometimes at night. I tried to tell her this wasn't like this, but she didn't believe me. I mean, I don't believe in ghosts, but I had no idea what the fuck else this could have been. Even though my mom let me sleep beside her, I didn't get much sleep that night. I was just staring at the space next to the bed. I was sweating so badly, my hair was actually drenched. I've never experienced something this terrifying before. Something so unbelievable. The next night, I didn't turn my light off. It gave me a bit of comfort, but I kept checking behind the bookshelf to make sure nothing was there, and I definitely couldn't sleep. I was sweating again, and in hindsight, I probably should have just stayed in my mom's room or pulled an all-nighter. But by that time, I had kind of figured my brain was playing tricks on me. It was just too unrealistic. But it's fucking happened again. And this time, it was worse. I didn't think it could get worse. I swear, I was about to fall asleep. I could feel myself be becoming that kind of weird delusional you get before you sleep, where you just kind of think of jumbled shit. Maybe that's just me. My eyes kept shutting and I felt really weak until the light went off. In a fucking instant, my entire mind was on fire and I was fully awake. Before I could even get up, I heard the shuffling start again this time a bit faster. The movements, quicker. I didn't wait to listen further though. I was on my feet, taking a single glimpse to the bookshelf. I saw something that will never leave my fucking mind. Behind the bookshelf was something hunched over. I saw a hand that was discolored with long claws on the side of the bookshelf. I couldn't make out a face or even what it was, but it wasn't human and it was no creature I'd ever seen. Needless to say, I got the fuck out of there. My body was filled with so much adrenaline, I almost stumbled over my own feet while running out of the room. I screamed to my mom as I ran down the stairs. I told her what I saw and I didn't want to go check, but I didn't want her to go on her own. So together, we got kitchen knives and flashlights. I still mostly stuck behind her. When we got back to the room, the door was closed and I could see the light on inside. 
When we entered, nothing was there. Nothing in the room had been changed. No books moved, no knickknacks shifted from their usual spots, no creature. Even the fucking lights were back on, door closed, like I'd never even left the room. But I know I saw something. My brain wasn't playing tricks on me. This was all too real. I never slept in that room again, and I absolutely refused to go back in, even during the daytime, without someone right next to me. After a few sleepless nights in my mom's room, we ended up moving out. And so far, in my new home, everything is perfectly fine. I don't know what that was back there. I don't know why it came there, suddenly, after I moved my bed. But there was certainly something, and I'll never forget it. In 1966, the small town of Malenkovsk, Siberia, vanished without a trace. The town wasn't particularly isolated, as it had been just north of Norilsk, a large mining city with a population of around 80,000. Nor was it disconnected socially, as people would often commute from Malenkovsk to Norilsk for work or to visit relatives, and vice versa. Despite this, its initial disappearance did not make national news and very few people outside of Norlisk ever found out. For all intents and purposes, Malenkovsk had never existed. And yet, if you were to ask the people of Norlisk about the town, you might just hear another story. One of local investigations and government cover-ups. Or you may hear nothing at all, as not all are liberal with their retelling of the story. I'm Diego Gomez, paranormal investigator, and today I'll explore with you just what happened in the small Siberian town. Malinkovsk was founded in 1965, when Nornikel, the corporation running the nickel plant in Norilsk, had wanted to expand beyond the city to find other precious metals in the Arctic Circle, pushed on by the economic boom brought in by the Soviet Union. When asked about Malinkovsk, however, Nornikel will insist they went to Astoshkoy Field, where they found the world's largest deposit of copper nickel ores instead, and that Malinkovsk never existed. But as we did our digging, and today I have for you, an interview with the previous head of police in Norlisk, who served during the events that transpired in Malinkovsk. Interview with Dmitry Petrov, head of the Norlisk Police Department. Dmitry coughs. And the sound of creaking leather is heard as he sits down in the provided armchair, clearing his throat. Diego. I hope you found your way all right. The office tends to give people trouble. Dimitri. It was no trouble. In our emails before, you said that something happened, that the town didn't vanish quietly. Can you tell me about that? Dimitri is heard taking a breath, a shaky and slow inhale before letting it out in one long exhale. We had first heard about it, us at the police station, when the calls started coming in. Malinkovsk didn't have a proper police force yet, so we took the calls from both communities and had two or three officers stationed in or near Malinkovsk to respond to them. Why didn't Malinkovsk have a police force? It was a uh, bureaucratic stuff, I guess. Nonical built the town, but it was technically just an extension of our town. It wasn't very far. Around 32 kilometers, or, uh, 20 miles? I see. So you started getting calls about the town disappearing? No, no. The calls were about the mine. The mine was smoking. They thought there was a fire. What were they mining? It was a mess. Platinum, copper, nickel. I didn't know a whole lot about it, but they had found some stuff worth digging for, and set up a camp. And then a few buildings, and eventually a town. It went real fast. I think they had 500 people living there in the first six months. And by the end, well, there was around nine, I suppose. Hundred? Yeah, nine hundred. But anyways, they called about the mine during the early afternoon. I don't remember the time exactly, but the mine, it had smoke coming from it. So we dispatched our officers, and they started getting buckets and water. NFD was still in Norlisk, so the fire truck had to go to the 32 kilometers to Malinkovsk. We didn't hear or think things would get so out of hand. There was nothing to burn. 
The mine was almost a kilometer outside of the town. No trees, but... Dimitri pauses. The only sound coming through the recording being his shaky breathing and what sounds like a foot tapping. The silence goes on for 19 seconds. Dimitri? I'm sorry, sorry. I can see it in my head again. It's not so easy. I understand. Do you need a break? No, I'm all right. When I'd been at the office, we didn't get much crime. Mostly small things like disagreements gone out of hand. A bar fight or two on weekends. This was a Tuesday. Everything was all right. About an hour after NFD dispatched a truck to the mine, things had gotten pretty quiet. We were getting worried because we hadn't heard back from our boys in Malinkolovsk. They weren't answering the radio either, so we were gearing up to go down there. We were going to take another truck too. Before we left, all at once, the phone started going off. Just back to back to back calls. Most of them weren't very clear. A lot of static coming over the lines, but they were talking about smoke. Smoke everywhere. They said they were stuck inside. They heard screaming and couldn't leave. So we took the last two trucks and a car and hauled ass down there. Six more of us and five firemen. The town caught fire. That's what we were thinking. Even from Norlisk, we were starting to see the smoke. The trucks couldn't go too fast on the dirt roads, maybe 30 kilometers an hour. We didn't arrive on scene until about half an hour after we left. A storm had started to whip up, blowing snow into the air so bad, we couldn't see more than five meters in front of us. There wasn't any mention of a storm in the forecast that morning. I remember that specifically. I thought the anchors lazy bastards. By the time we got there, Smoke was everywhere, mixing with the snow dust in the air to turn everything a foggy grey. When we finally got eyes on the town, smoke had wrapped around the buildings like a snake, covering them and making it impossible to tell what was burning and what wasn't. They burned even during the storm? Yes, we didn't have time to stop and ponder it. We had work to do, though in hindsight, the fire wasn't all that unusual. The smoke was strange. It wasn't rising into the sky. It stayed low, like a fog. It was almost like it was heavy and couldn't get off the ground. We thought we could hear people from outside town, voices carrying to us through the whipping wind, though just barely. We, we thought they were screaming. Dimitri is noted to have been shaking at this point, face pale and eyes wide. He was slowly becoming less and less legible over the recording. Do you need a break? No, I can, uh, I can keep going. How about we take a minute to break? I've got coffee on the kettle and Clara should be done with dinner by now. Let's have a bite to eat. Take a moment to prepare. Okay. The recording cuts out. In 1989, a team of Soviet engineers led by an individual named Mr. Azakov began drilling for oil somewhere within Siberia. They drilled a hole of 14.4 kilometers or nine miles beneath the surface before breaking into a cavity deep in the earth, one not filled with oil as they had previously expected. Intrigued by this discovery, they lowered down sensory equipment in an attempt to study this cavity. They found, in the brief moments before their equipment was burned to ash, that the temperature inside the cavity exceeded 1000 degrees Celsius or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. They also claimed to have heard the voices of the damned, screaming in agony and torment. Shortly after, the project was abandoned and all data was either seized by the government or destroyed. This incident has since been dubbed the well to hell. Dimitri. Your wife. She makes a wonderful meatloaf. Thank you. Of course, you're our guest. Dimitri clears his throat, passing his hands on his knees and pausing for a few moments. So, where did I leave off? You had just got into town and told me about the smoke and snow making it hard to see. And you mentioned screaming. Hmm, I remember now. This was mostly the firefighters show. We were there for support and to make people out of the city. The firefighters needed to find out what was burning and what wasn't, so they could try to set up a control line, stop the fire from moving anyone. When we went in, it was a bit easier to tell. I'd say around half the buildings were burning. NFD started working right away, 
a few of us digging up trenches in the snow between buildings to stop the fire from spreading to them, while they got to work spraying down the blazers that seemed the most out of control or likely to spread. The other officers and I had been wearing respirators. We often had to work with firefighters in Norlisk because of how few there were, so we already knew that we were doing and had gear that fit. Three of us started clearing homes, searching for survivors, but there was nobody. Every building we went to, we found no one. Normally, that might be considered good, but we saw no one in the streets. No one anywhere. A thousand people in this town, and we didn't see or hear a single one. What about the screaming you heard before? Gone. The only sounds then were the fires roaring, the wood crackling, and the wind whistling as it whipped past us, blowing snow and smoke into our faces. Could they have died in the fires? The idea that every person in that city, or even a majority of them, had died in the fires, despite us having received so many calls from them under an hour ago, seemed unlikely. We had thought they might have moved out of town in a group, stuck together and been waiting somewhere for us to find them. So Maxim and I split off and started searching the streets while the rest kept working. Walking through a burning city with low visibility, we knew what we were doing. What signs meant the fire was too dangerous ahead? When to fall back and when to press forwards? At that point, our biggest worry was that the people were trapped somewhere by the fire. We went a few blocks without a single sign of life. When things started to get strange. More so than they already had? Yes. We had started to hear something in the wind, almost like it was carrying whispers to us, incoherent, but very much real. We followed them the best that we could with the storm getting worse and worse, and soon we found ourselves at the edge of town. By now, the sound was louder. It was singing. We could hear hundreds of voices singing, some in harmony, some not, but all seemed to be singing the same song. I had gotten excited, glad we found them, but Maxim, he was not so sure. Why are they at the mine? The fire started there, he had said. But I told them it was fine. They were singing, after all. No doubt to keep the children calm and make it easier to find them. What were they singing? I don't know. It was a joyful tune, but not one I recognised, and we were too far away to hear the words. We couldn't go to them, not on foot. Even with the dirt road, walking through a blizzard like that in an open field, you can get lost easily. We went back for the car. It took us maybe ten minutes. We told the others what we had found, and they wanted one of us to go back with the car. We didn't have personal radios back then, just the ones in vehicles, and they wanted to know what was going on, and how soon a rescue operation needed to happen. We had hoped everyone would sit tight until they got the fires under control, but their safety was our priority. I was chosen to go back to them. Dimitri again sounds unwell, and he takes a moment to collect himself before continuing. They were gone. When I got there. What? The people at the mine. They were gone. I drove to the mine, and there was nobody there. I saw cars, and thought they might have been inside, but mine? It spat smoke like the earth was vomiting its heat, and rage into the sky. So forceful, that standing at the entrance made me sway like a child in a storm. Even with my respirator, it stank of burning meat and sulphur. I had to resist the urge to rip off my mask and empty my stomach on the snow. I was preparing to return to the radio, thinking about how I would tell them what I found, what I could say to explain. And I heard it, coming from that mine, bouncing off the walls and ringing through the air. I heard singing. Dimitri raises a shaking hand to his brow, wiping the sweat from it as he speaks. I do not know the words. I wasn't good with the language. I didn't recognize it. I'm sorry. But they sang that happy tune again. First one voice, but many, many more followed it. It was so loud I had to hold my ears. It made my head pound. I knew I should have left. Should have told the others what happened and waited for help. But I needed to know. I needed to know why our officers would go down this place without telling us. Why the townspeople were in a smoking, stinking mine. I fought my way through the burning smoke and relentless singing, walking into the mine. 
My respirator protected me from the smoke, but not the growing smells within. Stank of charcoal, of burning methane and stomach turning copper. And more than once, I had to stop and focus on my breathing to stop from ripping my mask off and vomiting. It was hot too. The heat was unyielding. The smoke blowing it into me and at a few points, I turned my back to it to give my front rest. The floor was wet and sticky. I couldn't see my own two feet, but something coated the floor that clung to my boots as I walked. I made it maybe 25 meters. I couldn't see a damn thing. The smoke was everywhere. And the singing began to change. The singing was still a cheerful tune. But the voices singing it were not happy anymore. They screamed in agony as they sang, each word sounded like it would rip from their throats and silence their song. I couldn't bear it anymore. I ran out of that cave and back to the car. I could hardly explain what had happened to my other officers. They didn't understand. They didn't believe me. Dimitri is gripping the mug of coffee tightly. Knuckles are pale white as he stares down at it intently for several moments. We didn't save the town. The fires were under control, and then they weren't, like they had decided it was time. The whole town burnt down, and we never found a single body. The rumour is, when the Soviet armed forces came down and blocked off the roads, set up camps around the old town, they pulled bodies out of the mine. Mangled, burnt bodies. Practically just bones. Why didn't this ever make the news? We weren't allowed to speak about it. People started to disappear from the town. Most knew it was the armed forces, but knowing what it was didn't make it any better. So, we stayed quiet. Why didn't anyone try to leave? Spread the word elsewhere? You've heard the city is locked down, yes? No real roads, no trains. The only way out is through the airport, and you need permission to enter and leave. That became official in 2001. But this has been this way since Malinkolovsk. Nobody leaves without permission, and if you were there for Malinkolovsk, you don't get permission. How did you get out? I snuck to the port 40 miles away and stowed away on a ship. Eventually, I made it here. Alright, well, thank you for your time. I'll make sure this gets out. Is there anything you want to say before this ends? Don't go to Siberia. Ha! <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. The recording cuts out again. I did go to Siberia though, and after some convincing, I was let into Norlisk for some artistic photography, and a lie about writing an article about the better parts of life in Norlisk. There wasn't a road, but we did manage to find Malinkovsk, or the place it should have been. There was no town, no burnt rubble hindered under the snow, and no military camp or anything of the sort. But we did find a mine. The first thing I felt when I hit the water was fear. It had been months since I'd last dived. Hell, I even got nervous when I took showers. But this guilt, this pain in my chest, I had to go back. I started to swim, arms cutting through the water and pulling me forward towards the submersible. I climbed atop it, taking the hand of Harry, who pulled me out of the water and gave me a stern look. There. Have you warmed up enough? he asked. Irritated that I'd needed to splash around in the water before getting started, but understanding why. I nodded, taking a deep breath through my nose and sighing. I'm ready. We climbed inside, where the rest of the crew waited. There was Robert, my previous captain, an older man in his late forties. His grey beard and short grey hair almost making a box around his face. He was sitting next to Irene, a short, stout woman with black hair and green eyes. I took my seat next to Robert, and Harry sat at the helm, starting to take us down. When Robert had heard I wanted to go back down, he called me insane. He hadn't seen what took Brett, what attacked us down there, but he had heard enough over the radio to know we should leave the island and go far, far away. Turns out, I wasn't the only one keen on going back down, however. Shortly after our conversation, we were met outside our office by a few men in military garbs. They greeted us as Lieutenant Harry and Lieutenant Commander Johnson. We're here on behalf of the NOAA, they had said. 
and I saw Robert's face twist with rage. He took a step forward, pointing at Johnson's chest and shouting in his face. Two months! It's been two whole months I was trying to get a hold of you. What the fuck kind of games are you playing at? Anne pulled on him, trying to pry him away from the men. Johnson wiped the spit from his face and answered calmly. We weren't allowed to make contact. Not until we had more information. He barely got the sentence out before Robert was shouting again. What information? What was that? What happened to that boy you sent to die? Johnson removed his hat, putting it to his chest and lowering his eyes. What happened to Brett was... We couldn't have known. The HOV jostled in the water, shaking me from my thoughts. The HOV we sat in was around 60 feet long. It was cramped inside and we didn't really have room to travel, as the inhabitable part of the HOV submersible was around 15 feet long. It had a control console at the front, with chairs for each of us behind it. Ahead of the console was our window, with lights on either side, shining out into the emptiness ahead. I looked out into the dark, gazing into it and waiting, half expecting something to glide out of the darkness and swallow us whole. What's our depth? I asked, shaking the thought from my head. Robber looked over the console in front of him before reading out 1400 meters. We were about halfway to the entrance of the trench, and I let out a shaky breath, which caused Irene to turn her head to look at me. You going to be able to handle this? she asked, and I gave her a solemn nod. We need you to go back into the trench again, Johnson had said to me, locking eyes and trying to read my reaction. He seemed surprised by my answer, eyes going a little wide when I agreed. I thought that would take more convincing, he joked, sitting back and letting out a breath. I could feel Robert wanting to speak, trying to come up with something to say, but I decided to continue. You're going to have to pay us a lot. But yeah, I get the feeling you wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. And you're sending some of your guys with us this time. I'm not going down there to die. And I want to know you're invested in my safety. A grin crossed his lips, and he nodded before replying calmly, Harry will be going with you, along with one of our navigation officers. You're going in a sub this time. You shouldn't even need to get your toes wet if we can help it, he'd said. And Robert finally found his words. Why? What could you possibly want down there? Johnson's face turned deadly serious, his voice low and firm. We're going to blow it up. 2,700 meters, time to get to work, Irene called, and I shook the days from my mind. We were all staring out the window now, watching the bubbles rise past us. Harry was next to speak. His voice sounded concerned for the first time since we met. Shouldn't we be seeing some by now? They've been all over the archipelago. I figured we should see them pouring out of here in swarms. We all stared for a few moments longer, before he turned and nudged me with his elbow. His voice irritated now. Well, you're the fucking expert here. Answer me. I glared at him, but Robert spoke for me, standing up as he did. You saw them once. You've got a head. Fucking use it. There are no experts. Not for something like this. Harry stared daggers into him for a moment, but seemed to back down, turning his head back to the console as he navigated us deeper into the trench. I nodded my appreciation at Robert, and he sat back down. The logistics of dropping a bomb into a mild wide opening in the ocean floor aren't as complicated as you might think. In fact, there should be no repercussions at all. The water pressure would compress the explosion and absorb most of its energy, and while the gases would bubble up to the surface, their harm to the environment would be minimal. Due to the nature of this threat, the damage to sea life wasn't a concern. However, this was a double-edged sword. Unless we were dropping something nuclear, the explosion wouldn't be big enough to vaporize everything within the trench. And while certainly doable, there was worry that what radiation made it into the atmosphere would rain down on the Galapagos Islands. And while the radiation left in the ocean would dilute into the water after about a day, it was possible that it could still cause some harm to the islands and their inhabitants. This meant we needed a smaller bomb and someone to put it in the perfect spot. A little thump was heard, as what looked like a squid bumped into the glass of our submersible. We all watched as it tried to keep pace with us, bumping into the glass again and again. That's 
Odd, said Irene, leaning forward and squinting at the strangely behaving squid. It slowly spun around, and Harry gagged at the sight of it. While the front of it had been untouched, the back was swollen and pulsing, covered in dozens of small holes, all clustered together. Small worms poked out of the holes, poking at the glass before retreating back inside. They were long and red, and had disc-like growths for heads. After a few more prods, it seemed to lose interest and drift away. We saw another, this one a stingray, its body missing its fins as they had been completely consumed by the worms. And as it floated past, we saw more and more, dozens of them drifting up and past us. Harry was taking deep breaths, and Irene put a hand on his shoulder, her voice somewhat soothing, though just barely. You okay? She asked him, and he shook his head for a moment, before regaining his composure and saying, Yeah, that was fucking disgusting. And that, we all agreed on. Why can't you just drop a bomb into the trench and be done with it? What good would be done by having us go down there? Robert demanded. His frustration began to grow again. We aren't nuking the trench. This is targeted bombing. And we need someone who has been down there before to help us pinpoint exactly what we're looking for. And what exactly are you looking for? I asked, my stomach twisting with anxiety. We believe there is some sort of source, like a nesting ground or a queen that these things are coming from. We believe if we blow it up, we'll be able to contain the threat. I began to reply that day in my head, walking through everything I'd seen in my mind's eye, as Robert spoke up again. He barely went in. He can't help. I cut him off, eyes going wide as one image came to the forefront of my mind. There was a whale. It had worms in it, hundreds, and they were big. Bigger than you'd believe. Big enough to yank Brett inside like he was a rag doll. And the whale? It was alive. They didn't kill it. The men both looked at each other and then back at me before answering. Yeah, that could be it. The sub was drifting to a stop now and I stood up, looking out through the glass. The others rose as well, each of us moving over to the glass to get a better look. Ahead of us, we saw glowing yellow lights, dim and faint, but there nonetheless. What's our depth? Robert asked as he reached out and put a hand on the glass. Irene moved back to her seat and read the numbers off the gauge, causing us all to grow quiet again. 7,400 metres. 74 metres below the surface of the ocean, nearly as deep as Mount Everest. Is that the bottom? Irene asked, and Harry filled it with the controls for a moment. Let's find out. And with the press of a button, the sub launched a flare into the distance. It flung out into the water, farther and farther away from us, and closer to the dim lights in the distance. After a few seconds, it ignited properly, starting to drift off down towards the floor, and I felt my stomach begin to twist and turn. The dim yellow lights we saw in the distance were illuminated now. At the bed of the trench was a field of writhing cysts, each one filled with a sickly yellow liquid that glowed softly against the dark ocean water, pulsing slowly with light and movement. They looked like the eyes of a fly, each one a single big mound with hundreds of small bubbles on its surface, each wriggling and twitching with life. From time to time, some of the Sith's small pustules would pop, releasing small waves of the worms and leaking a thick, viscous fluid into the water that sank to the bottom and started to clump together, slowly forming a new, smaller cyst. Good God, Robert said taking a step away from the glass and resting a hand on the wall next to him, looking close to losing his lunch. And to be fair, we all were at that point. Up one nest, Harry said, but no will in sight. Unfortunately, what greeted us next was far worse than the whale. We couldn't see it. Not all of it, at least. It was too dark and too big. We caught sight of it when it began to investigate the flare sinking down towards the nest. At first, it was just a dark shape in the water, slowly moving around the flare. But as it got closer, we began to see more of its long, dark form. Harry fired off a second flare, and as it showed closer to the thing, we got a much better look. Circling around the mound of cysts was a massive, pale black, eel-like creature. 
Its body was slender and slimy, with a long white fin on its top and bottom, running the length of its body, and two more regular fins on either side that waved and twisted as it turned through the water. We could feel the water being displaced by its powerful movements from there, jostling our sub, and it slowly turned, revealing its face to us. It was a gaping maw, round and lined with rows and rows of teeth. It dripped a sickly yellow liquid, and as the creature slowly lowered its head to the ocean floor, its body writhed and convulsed, and we saw a round shape push up its body, like how an egg can be seen travelling down the belly of a snake. When the shape reached the mouth, the creature vomited a large clump of the yellow snot onto the ocean floor, which wriggled and formed into another cyst. We need to go. We can't blow that thing up. We need, hell, missiles or something, Irene said. All of our eyes locked onto the shape, floating around the ocean like a ribbon caught in a current. Harry nodded slowly and began to take us back up. As he did, however, the thing seemed to lose interest in the dimming flares and catch sight of us. The last thing we saw before the flares died out was its massive form, waving back and forth in the water like a snake as it made its approach. We sat frozen, too afraid to move or speak, and Irene's hand slowly reached out and pressed a button, shutting off the lights. After a few more seconds had passed, Robert spoke up. Should we fire another flare? Maybe it'll go after it and we can get away. Harry's hand hovered over the control to launch the flare, shaking. He slowly reached down and pressed it. We all watched the flare sail out into the water like a dim shooting star before erupting into light. Just 30 meters in front of us, headed straight for us with its gaping mouth stretching open wider somehow, was the queen. The submersible descended into chaos as it made contact, smashing into us and latching onto the window like a suction cup, knocking all of us out of our seats. The sub was designed to withstand the immense pressure of the ocean depths, but not this, and the glass began to crack and seep water into the helm. We were halfway inside of its mouth, and its curved teeth gripped the sub, pulling us deeper as they cut small white lines into the glass. Harry was the first one up, firing flares as fast as he could, and three more shot off, landing on the creature. It didn't seem to appreciate this and let go, flinging the submersible through the water. Harry was yanking on the sticks now, steadying the thing and driving it away as fast as he could, but it wasn't exactly designed for speed, and we were sure that thing would be right behind us, coming back to finish the job. We couldn't run. We were trapped in this metal coffin at the bottom of the ocean, 15 feet of air in miles of water. I was gripping the chair with all my strength, knocking turning white as I did, and Irene was frantically looking over the controls, searching for some way out of the situation, some magic button to save us. We couldn't drop the bomb. It had to be carefully deployed with the arm on our craft, and blowing it up before we made it at least 2,000 metres away would surely end in us getting caught in the explosion. So instead, we sat and waited to die. We couldn't see it. We didn't have a viewpoint at the back of the HOV, but we could hear it. Its long body moving the water aside, back and forth, and slow, long motions. Harry held the stick, powering us forward, but the rest of us were staring at the depth gauge as it slowly ticked up and up. 7,200 meters, 7,150, 7,100. We kept climbing, waiting for our ship to come to a stop, waiting for it to grab our engine and tear us to shreds. But as we got higher and higher, we started to breathe and started to calm down somewhat. After a while, we couldn't hear it anymore. Couldn't feel the waves it caused under the water pushing us back and forth. And for a brief moment, we felt we could relax. That is, until we saw the surface. From the light coming down through the water, we could see dozens of fish, all drifting off, floating weirdly. And we knew, we knew it was the worms. We may have survived, but we also failed, and whatever that was, it was only going to get worse. I'm back on land now, back in my home, sitting at my desk. I don't have a happy ending for you. Those things are still out there, and we couldn't stop them. Hopefully, the NOAA has a plan.
because the ocean isn't safe anymore. Please, stay out of the water. Sat at her side, I watched the heart monitor pulse weaker and weaker as my mother's life faded. Her final sigh coming to an end as she breathed her last. Tears rolled down my cheeks and I squeezed her hand one final time. My body was numb. My mind fogged with memories of her life. Taking me and my siblings to Six Flags. Eyes betraying her smile as she watched our reactions in the rear view mirror when we realised where we were going. How she hugged me when she finally got custody from dad and I got to see her for the first time in months. Welcoming me and my friends inside with hot chocolate after a long play in the snow. Telling us to leave our boots outside. I broke down. The feeling of loss that had been building from the moment she collapsed from a stroke a week ago, finally escaping the vault of my soul. My hand pressed against my temple as the pain began to build there, my vision going blurry for a moment. Where am I? Where's mom? I asked, head swiveling around, surveying the restaurants I was in as my headache continued to bloom and spread. What are you talking about? Charlotte asked, reaching a hand out to squeeze mine. Are you okay? Maybe we should take you to the hospital. We were on our fourth date again. We'd just been bowling, and now we're at a restaurant. No, I'm okay. What were you saying? I asked, and she eyed me nervously, watching my face and biting her lip with concern before deciding I must be okay. I was asking about the next few chapters of your book. It's been almost a month since I've heard anything from you or seen any of your writing. We're getting nervous, Charlotte said speaking in the voice of John, my publishing manager. I set the packet down on John's desk, eagerly watching him pick it up and flip through the pages. All right, I'll take a look at this, but please keep me updated. No more long silences. Her heart monitor was silent, and I stared down at her, squeezing her hand gently, rubbing my thumb in circles on her wrinkled dry skin. Something felt wrong. She was my mother. She had died just before my eyes. Didn't I cry? Or shouldn't I? I thought I had cried, but now I felt no tears. My hands shot to my forehead, pressing against my temples and rubbing as the headache came back in pulsing, pounding waves. I let out a groan of agony and felt a hand on my cheek, unlike my mother's. This hand was soft and warm, and it lifted my head to face her. You don't look so good. We should get you some help. Charlotte's innocent hazel eyes resting just below walnut brown bangs started into mine with sincerity and for a moment I smiled but that quickly fell away as I wondered why she was touching me being so kind I had loved her once hadn't I now she sat here before me during our best date and I felt bored disinterested the slam of the packet hitting the desk ripped me from my thoughts this is sick the story is too dark how are we supposed to sell this who would read something like this? John was angry, I think. I couldn't focus on his words. I was too distracted, thinking about how much this had hurt me once before. You need to rewrite these chapters, or this book isn't going to make the shells. Rewrite them? I had before, but now I couldn't be bothered to try. Whatever had driven me to write the book before was gone. Jesus, you don't even care, do you? You need help. What? Do you need help? The nurse asked placing a hand on my shoulder as I stood looking down at the woman in the bed. She was pale, freckles dotting her face like embers coming from her fire-red hair, just like mine. She seemed so familiar. I must have seen her somewhere before. Maybe at the coffee shop I worked at, or someone I'd seen passing on the street. Who was she? I asked, and the nurse's brow wrinkled with concern. She's your mother. Are you feeling okay? You need help. I do. You need help. You need help. You need help. Help me! I cried out. The cold tree barking against my back, digging into my skin and tearing my shirt, leaving long scratches down my body. My hands gripped the wrist of the appendage that held my throat, and my legs swung and kicked at its black bony torso, but the thing didn't budge. I could only see out of my left eye. My right had been pushed down into its socket by the long tube that forced its way past into my skull. I choked on my words, trying to cry for help again as its claws dug into my skin. 
I know you put a lot of work into this book, but we can't justify working with you anymore. Your initial idea was very good, but you fumbled the delivery, and it just makes sense to stick to our better prospects. I'm sorry, but we have to let you go, John said firmly from behind his desk. The first time he'd said this, I begged, humiliated myself further and groveled, making promises and offering to take lower royalties for another chance. But now, I couldn't even remember what the book was about or why I cared so much about it to begin with. John spoke up again from behind his desk, a little different now, his voice almost sinister. It was a pleasure to meet you. I felt its long, worm-like tongue slither past my eye, causing it to roll down and out of my alignment as the thing pulled on my skin and brain, bile rising into my throat from the sick sensation. The thing took a step back, and I fell to the floor as it released my bleeding neck and dropped onto all fours. It was covered in thick black fur with grey speckles down its side. The fur on its spine stood up straighter and longer than the rest and its four limbs all had four digits that looked perfect for gripping its prey. Gripping me. Behind it swung a long furry tail, the end a tuft of grey hair. Its face was hairless, a long narrow skull covered in wrinkly pink skin that ended in a short trunk, where its tongue retracted into. Its beady black eyes stared at me for a few moments before it walked past, vanishing into the woods. My hand rose to feel my right eye, now crooked and pointing lower than the other, a gap above it where the tongue had slid past, oozing blood. I sighed and stood up, walking away. I don't know what it did to me, but it took something. My mind is a foggy mess, and I can hardly remember my own name. I thought writing this might help, help me feel something again, or straighten out my memories, but it hasn't. I guess I'll post this. Maybe it'll help one of you. Stay out of the woods.